Welcome to Indie Film Forum. I'm your host, Kalpana Biswas. My guest today is an award-winning independent filmmaker and musician, Julie Sokolow. Julie grew up in New Jersey and graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, and she is versatile. She is the director, producer, writer, cinematographer, editor, and music composer of most of her films. Her documentaries have appeared at the New York Times, Time, and Huffington Post. She's also a passionate advocate for artists' rights. She has directed the Healthy Artists documentary series, which profiles over 40 uninsured artists who are struggling to afford health care. Her first documentary feature, Aspie Seeks Love, won Best Documentary at the 2015 CineQuest Film Festival. And as a lo-fi musician, Julie has won the acclaim of Pitchfork, Wire, and The Washington Post for her album, Something About Violins. She performs and tours around the country in addition to making her remarkable films. I'm happy to introduce Julie Sokolow to you today. up in New Jersey and then you came to Pittsburgh um, and now you've turned into this wonderfully versatile filmmaker. Uh, what were the steps in your development? You brought New Jersey into the conversation. So I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey in a pretty homogenous kind of area and when you feel different at all like that is very pronounced in an area like that. So that mixed with the fact of consuming a lot of mainstream media um, that portrayed you know, women in a very particular kind of way or relationships in a very particular kind of way that you know, I couldn't really relate to fully. I think it just made me want to create stories that would you know, exemplify like my experience or my friends' experiences and go from there. So when I moved to Pittsburgh for school and started to do more creative pursuits, fiction writing, filmmaking, uh, music, that all kind of combined into this urge to, to just like tell stories that I hadn't uh, seen before. So that was the goal, um, lofty, <laughs> granted. Um, and then you know, you, as you go as a creative person and start to experience other people's independent films and stories, you realize, oh yeah, they're, they're all, there are these incredible diverse stories out there. It's just a matter of finding them. They might not be playing on you know, NBC or whatever. You might have to go off the beaten path and discover them. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of contribute to that vein of storytelling. I just was in this film studies class where we watched a lot of classics and I was very moved by them on this visceral level. So I was getting more into film. I was starting to try to write screenplays. And at that time, I met a very inspiring writer who I um, wanted to like write stories about him. He was schizophrenic. We were very close friends. He struggled with alcoholism. And I started trying to write stories about our adventures together, I suppose. And I couldn't do him justice or myself. So I started filming him and doing a documentary about him. So that was actually my first try at a documentary. And that project went on for a couple of years and actually, sadly, um, kind of crashed and burned because of just interpersonal issues that were really challenging um, to work around. And, and uh, I didn't know if I was ever gonna make another film again or anything. And it, luckily, at that time, things were starting up with Aspie Seeks Love and Healthy Artists. and taking me in a very positive direction with, with my filmmaking. But 
um, I think for filmmakers out there, every filmmaker I know has a project that took them years that never came out. It's almost like a rite of passage. <laughs> so I don't think anyone should. I'm glad should've... you talk about that. Yeah. Because yeah, you know, that's good to know that artists go through that whole process of well, things not working out. And yeah. then how do you move on from there? Definitely. And I, I mean, it definitely gives you more strength going forward to have an experience like that and say, oh, I must really love doing this if I'm continuing on after. I mean, hundreds of hours of footage, so many interviews, so much heart and soul and blood, sweat, tears into something that never comes out. And that's sharing a film is like one of the most rewarding things on earth. After you make the film, you know, like you're so in your head for like with Aspie Seeks Love, you know, I had friends who probably wondered, is this thing ever going to come out? Like, has she gone crazy? Like, you know, she's just like hoarding footage in her room. There's terabytes of, you know, tangled drives living up in her attic with her. It's like, you know, the kind of and filmmaking that I do, it's like I live very cheaply. You know, I don't own a car. I don't, like, have dependents. I live in a certain way that's around filmmaking as sort of the main priority in my life. Um, I wake up and start editing and I, it's midnight, I'm still like editing. So um, I don't know if that dedication has to be there to be a filmmaker, but I um, assume it might have to be there from what I see of you know, other people who are in this field for the long haul and it's not just a hobby. Yeah, so it's challenging. It's the, the economics of it is challenging, the, the, the process of, of, you know, you have to be dedicated in terms of time that you spend on it. So, which means that you're really uh, not spending time doing other things that a lot of people are doing. Uh, th that must be difficult. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I still have luckily a lot of uh, friends, a big social life, which is kind of tied to the work that I do. Like I, most of my friends are artists and they have shows, so I go see their shows, whether it's like they're playing a concert or they're screening their films and vice versa. And I think that's also really important for filmmakers and artists to be in the artistic community. You really can't isolate yourself too much when it comes, because ultimately you're making a piece of work that you want to be shared and seen and felt with other people. So you can create that to some degree in isolation, but the end goal typically is to share that. Is there also a, a, a give and take there? I mean, in terms of, uh, apart from having an audience that actually looks at your work or gives you feedback, is there a learning that happens when you're with art, other artists that you would not otherwise be able to really internalize? Definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, a friend of mine, Alan Lewandowski, who is the front man of a band called The Working Poor and Anita Fix that have played around Pittsburgh for like almost 20 years. He's a great friend, artistic hero of mine, and he composed half the soundtrack to Aspie Seeks Love. So he, he wrote those songs independently. I knew of him in the scene. I always wanted to do something with him. And I said, okay, these songs would be perfect for this movie. So even something like that or knowing um, different... Uh, venue owners in town like Garfield Artworks or Awesome Books and having you know scenes in the film take place at those venues and we showcase like David and Aspie Seeks Love doing literary literary readings so it's um it's interesting how art forms kind of all weave together in this certain way I'll see one of my photographer friends do an art show and I'll say I want the next film I do to have the mood of that picture that she just took or something. And I guess because you're so immersed in the artist uh, community, um, your Healthy Artist Project, which was so interesting and uh, so well uh, received, uh, both by the artist community as well as people outside, uh, that came about and it had the real understanding of the, of the artists and their problems. So in 2011, 2012, I was uh, sort of just coming right out of undergrad college. I was a little bit naive and idealistic about the world and sort of saying, oh my goodness, you know, how is it that any American could be without health care or could go bankrupt over medical bills and just having this sense of this injustice can't actually be the case, mm -hmm. that the United States spends you know, twice as much on health care and we don't provide it to everyone, that we're the only industrialized nation without universal health care and sort of starting to talk to my friends, which happen to be the artist community, and okay, all of these people are uninsured because they're all working non-traditional jobs, freelance jobs, 
adjunct professor jobs. And I think demystifying this whole system of like, you know, f kind of feeling lied to, like feeling like, you know, I have a f friends who went to Carnegie Mellon University, top universities, um, who got their MFAs and who can't afford health care and they are poverty, poverty level. And how is this right? How is this the case? And so taking that sort of anger about the injustice and saying, well, that is ugly. Who wants to listen, <laughs> listen to me complain about that? And it, realizing that fundamentally, like my feeling was love for these people. I love my friends. I love these artists. I love what they create. So let's talk about that instead. So like I think the Healthy Artist series is really just like a celebration of these people and the work that they do and their valuable contributions to society and their quirkiness and their humor and vision. And oh, by the way, look at this great person. They can't even go to the doctor. <laughs> like how crazy is that? And I think that that's what resonated was that the focus was on celebrating people. Hi, my name is Julie, and I'm a writer, musician, and filmmaker. I love what I do, but sometimes things can get in the way. For example, I had a routine medical checkup, and here's the bill. About a year ago, I started filming my friends in the Pittsburgh art scene for a grassroots documentary series called Healthy Artists. I really wanted to hear their healthcare stories. I made too much money to be covered by the state programs, but I didn't make enough money to afford the good health care. So I was at this funny in-between. I, I have friends that do like, like music that haven't been to a doctor in like 20 years because they can't afford it. I've been working in this part-time nonprofit job for a decade, and um, I've never had health care through that job. I can't dependably pay for it because I'm generally working paycheck to, to paycheck. As a lower income, uh, entrepreneur, it's impossible to start a small business or, or have your own to be self-employed if you don't have insurance. I have Crohn's disease. I am currently uninsured. This isn't just about artists. So many people in America lack access to affordable quality health care, and that's really scary. 45,000 Americans die every year just because they're uninsured. If something ever happened where it intensified or it had a severe flare-up, I really don't know what I would do. I mean, I guess I would go to the hospital and then spend the rest of my life in debt. In 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. I believe a healthy democracy is founded on equality, but how can we fix a broken system? I decided to pose this question within my community, so I invited folks out for a night of art and advocacy. I was nervous. I was wondering, will people really come out on a Friday night for a night of talking about healthcare? beyond anything I expected, far beyond my expectation. For me, this series is so interesting because it takes so many disparate stories and makes them impactful and coherent. I think it's important to understand what's going on at the policy level, then also bring it down to the community and make sure everyone understands what's going on in healthcare. America is the only industrialized nation without universal health care. But if we can bring people together locally, we can do it everywhere. Now is the time to stand up. I hope you'll agree and say, healthy people make a healthy democracy. Julie, when you're several sort of struggling artists together, then the whole collaboration process, does that become difficult because of the economics of it? I mean, would you have the means to support each other in that sense? Yeah, I, I think there's some kind of quote about how like rich people get together and talk about art and <laughs> artists talk about money. <laughs> so that's definitely somewhat true. You know, a lot of the artists' friends I have, we're all kind of struggling to get the same grants. Um, Aspie Seeks Love was partly funded by the Pittsburgh Foundation. Uh, they put out this creative development grant that really catalyzed that project ever happening and getting off the ground. Um, so we're all sort of 
struggling collaborating uh, on Facebook, sharing lists of like residency programs or MFA programs, and then griping about MFA programs and how no one can really get a teaching job anymore these days. So I think it's good. The griping can inspire a dialogue about how to change the system fundamentally. And one of those changes I see needed is that artists do need to have self-respect and to present that and project that in the world and say, you know, what we're doing is legitimate work that is enjoyed by people and it's not free labor. Just because we live in an era where you can steal people's, you know, music or films that they create online, it doesn't mean that those it aren't real, you know, uh, projects and products that people have worked on and poured over. And I'm not demonizing people who pirate things because I know that's sort of the culture we live in, but how can we find other solutions to create a sustainable lifestyle for artists who contribute to society. And it's a conversation we need to have more. And then it all culminated in the, your first documentary feature now, um, Aspie Seeks Love. How did that come about and uh, you know, what went into actually making that film? Yeah, it's interesting too because with Aspie Seeks Love, uh, the main character is named David Matthews, and he is this quirky guy who sticks out like a sore thumb in this very American Levittown-style suburbs. So when I first met him, uh, I had actually seen him around Pittsburgh. I had seen him around town wearing this long tweed coat and this hat and kind of r running around at you know different record stores, and I was like, who's that guy? Like He kind of stands out in this way. And um, he reached out to me on Facebook and said, I've seen your films, I think you should make one about me. Interesting. So we met for coffee and his sense of humor just was astounding. I loved it, it was very dry, very intellectual. Um, and he expressed his desire to find love. And it was kind of a side note, oh yeah, I was diagnosed with Asperger's recently. So I first wanted to make a film about just this guy who's a little bit alienated in all these different spheres of his life, but he's extremely talented, extremely funny, and just follow him and see where his quest for companionship would go. And as we developed the, the film, the documentary, which took four years to make, um, Asperger's became more and more a part of his narrative because he was kind of, it was kind of a coming of age story of like this guy who went 41 years without being diagnosed all of a sudden he's diagnosed and he's going to meetup groups and meeting other people on the autism spectrum and finding connection there and also finding disconnection there and trying to portray that in a real gritty way and not a saccharine, sugar-coated way of that experience. Do you like to cuddle? Yes, I do. Don't let my sober facade fool you. Hello, my name is David Matthews. I'm an artist, a fiction writer, and a man with Asperger's syndrome. This is my coconut menagerie. Bought this one in 1995, the day before the O.J. Simpson trial verdict. My postcard collection. I like the Eastern Europeanness of it. Most kids try to fit in. He didn't really try to fit in. He just wanted to be himself. He had the nicknames on campus. The one that stands out to me for whatever reason is people call him Squid Man. I've been looking for love for a very, very long time. This is my very first personal ad flyer ever. January 1995. Surrender to Dave. Dating and or friendship. Find Dave a date. Over the next 15 years, I posted hundreds of copies of personal ad flyers. A woman I know said I shouldn't post this photo because it makes me look scary to women. Stranded on my own mental island. I met someone on OkCupid. We'll see how that goes. It looks like the height of an endangered species. My acquaintance was immediately like, you know, is he even capable of love? I mean, that, that hurt. Sometimes I wish I were part of an old, happily married couple. I don't know if that will ever happen. At least I lived my life the way I'd wanted to. 
geekily. I wouldn't be losing myself by degrees with every bed. So did you uh, feel that there was a difference in uh, tone uh, when you moved from the healthy artist to something, uh, to Aspie Seeks Love? It's interesting. I never saw myself as a political filmmaker or, you know, an activist filmmaker, but the Healthy Artist series definitely planted a seed of, I think film should matter, and I think that the personal is political and vice versa. So going into Aspie Seeks Love, I really wanted that to feel like a quirky, fun narrative film that was just following this guy. He's making these like off-color remarks sometimes and, you know, seeking companionship, seeking sex, you know, like let's be real and gritty about what's going on in, in his life and also celebrate his writing and his art artistry because he's a writer and he's trying to find his voice in the film and uh, get his first book pub published. But I think that, you know, having that awareness of making a film that matters and the fact that we are dealing with the autism spectrum, not only with David, the main character, having Asperger's, but his community going into autism support groups, you cannot do that lightly. You know, you can show elements of humorous banter there, but you also have to acknowledge and represent that this is a it's a true struggle. I mean, being a parent of a child on the spectrum, and these are also high functioning um, groups for the most part that he's in, but some of these people have been diagnosed with you know, pervasive developmental delay, Tourette's, um, OCD, like in, in this whole path of finding out that they're on the autism spectrum and still being kind of unclear what their diagnosis is. It's very serious. So, um, and the issue of companionship, I mean, starting off with this sort of quirky idea of let's follow this guy who wants to get a date, right, who's on OkCupid on online dating, but then investigating, there's something deeper here. It's about the stigma that, you know, when you have a group of people on the autism spectrum and you're noticing that there's four guys to every one girl and all of these guys are single, all of them are lonely and maybe there's despair that comes from not being able to have a partner. And, um, you know, it's a serious issue that affects quality of life and it has to do with the stigma that just society has around people on the spectrum that filters into dating of why, you know, it's hard for them to date even if they want to. So I think that you end up covering serious topics um, in, in ways that are more character driven. One of the, the skills that you've also acquired in the, in the whole process of uh, activism and filmmaking is a, uh, the really uh, effective use of uh, social media. How did you come to that? And also the film that uh, now has gone viral. You say it has about a million hits. I was commissioned to direct a film called Street Doctor about Dr. Jim Withers, who is Pittsburgh based, and he runs Operation Safety Net. So he goes out into the streets at night uh, looking for homeless people and to provide them with medical care that they would be uh, unable to get access to otherwise, uh, either for fear of going into the ER or, you know, just not having the resources. So it also made me realize that I'm not just interested in filming artists, I'm interested in filming visionary people, heroic people who kind of took a risk in order to be themselves and to, like, see their vision out in the world that, you know, was kind of out of the ordinary. So. I went for a couple days and filmed him on his, you know, normal, I guess, visitations where he just goes out down through downtown Pittsburgh and under bridges and delivers socks and bags of sandwiches and takes blood pressure and heart rate and all of that. And then the next day we filmed him going into the homes of people who had been uh, like rehabilitated and gotten off the street through the help of his program. So this short film ended up getting cut down to like a less than five minute piece and we put, put it online and I sent it out to like Huffington Post and a few other places and it went viral. It was crazy. So in like, I don't know, a few weeks it had over 500,000 views and he, you know, was being featured on the news and just various places because of kind of the video sparking that. 
um, seeing it on Gawker and Upworthy and BuzzFeed and people saying, you know, it's interesting to see how people sort of position these things in marketable ways of like the headline would say, oh, look at this doctor who dresses like a homeless man, find out why. And it's like, okay, well, he's doing it to make people feel more comfortable at the street level interacting with him. But it was sort of a catchy way for people to get, you know, eyeballs on the video. But it was great because it raised a lot of um, awareness for his program and, and some funding for it as well. And it was just a really interesting experience to have something that you create go viral and affect people in that way. And it's, it's definitely stuck with me as a feeling of like films can really change the world. Um, not that you know a four minute film drastically changes the world, but, but it has the potential to cause a ripple effect. It started with me and formerly homeless guy Mike going out under, under the bridges at night. Mike had had a homeless experience of his own for about seven years. He was going out and giving blankets and food to people. And I asked him, you know, I'm a doctor, can I go out with you? He said, there's a lot of medical needs out there. And he said, okay, don't dress like a doctor and don't act like a jerk. I, t I dressed like a homeless person. I, I got a book and I read about how how to dress like a homeless person and, and mingle, and, and so that's how I got started. This is a, actually a portable splint that you can put on someone's arm if, it's, if you find a fractured arm. It's, there's bandaging material. It's always good to have cough and cold medicines and inhalers. Vitamins and probably pain medicines are the most useful. Blood pressure cuff. Antibiotics should come next. I thought we needed a classroom where we could see what things looked like from the perspective of excluded people. <laughs> yeah, we have certain people in the street that take take it upon themselves to uh, break you in. It's a test for the service provider. In current health care, so much of it is a business. It is a calling. It's not just a business. It's a blessing about the streets. It's so vivid. You can actually feel it and do it because you are outside of the structure. Okay. Here's Sammy. Sammy. That's the old Mary. You go, sweetie. Thank you. Let me get you a snack pack. You homeless, man? Which one? Okay. Which He's a People out there are hanging on for dear life. One of the very first people that I encountered was an 85 year old homeless guy. He had paranoid thoughts and he thought people were chasing him. And as long as we kept his identity secret, we could work with him. And his legs got so bad that. Um, he actually would get maggots in them. We would have to stretch ourselves and, and care enough to stretch ourselves into their world, into their reality. To me, that's a whole new frontier for rediscovering how healthcare should be delivered. Do you guys remember how you felt during the first few runs that you would make? Mike terrified me. I still do periodically, right? Yep. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 22 years later now, and we're still working together. I'm being on here. I'm just in the Air Force from 66 to 70. I'm 66 years old, man. You like Motrin or Tylenol? Uh, I, I got Motrin. I need Tylenol. One of the things that happens is you see yourself in street people. You know, if you're honest, you see, I could have been there. I could have been me. What's, what do you have as your next uh, film? My next feature I'm in production on is uh, going to be about the first transgender firefighter in New York City. So she is a third generation firefighter. Her name's Brooke Guinan, and her father was a firefighter, grandfather was a firefighter. So she has been advocating for diversity in a department that is 91% uh, white male, mostly straight. Um, so she has come in and made it her mission to bring more women into the department as well as more LGBTQ people to address the significant disparity that there's only 46 females out of a force of 10,000 firefighters. Thank you, Julie, and thank you for watching Indie Film Forum. I'm Kalpana Biswas. See you again next time. For more information on Julie Sokolo and Indie Film Forum, please visit our websites. Coming up. Mm -hmm.